In this video, we're going to be finding out about a project being undertaken by a globalist entity that, if it goes through, will subvert national sovereignty everywhere. Using Wi-Fi without NordVPN could mean sharing your private stuff with more people than you think. NordVPN. Online security starts with a click. Yet again. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in and for watching. This is Crypto Rich, but we're not talking about crypto. We are talking about sovereignty and freedom and democracy and accountability and things like that. Now, before I introduce my guest, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, Crypto Rich YT. Join my official Telegram announcements channel. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please, 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 please come and support my work on bit.ly slash Crypto Rich 3 Speak bit.ly slash crypto rich odyssey and bit.ly slash crypto rich rumble which i still haven't written up but it's easy to remember hi cat thank you so much for making yourself available hi thanks for having me today you are so welcome and you are dr cat lindley and you are based in the united states and we're going to be talking about the subversion of national sovereignty but do you want to start by saying a little bit about yourself and who you are and why you are and then we can go into what we're going to talk about Sounds great. Thank you. So I was born in Croatia and um, at the time it was Yugoslavia. I lived there until I was 18. Uh, we kind of knew the war was going to start. So my family uh, wanted me to leave. And I went to live in Italy as a nanny and actually left one day before Split was attacked. Split is on the Dalmatian coast. Um, so, you know, I was kind of sheltered as a child. So all of a sudden I find myself in this, you know, wild, wild world, uh, living uh, with a family. I didn't really speak Italian at the time, but I, I was really lucky to find a great family. I lived with them for a few years, um, even lived in England for six months, but it rained and I was depressed. So I decided to leave England, go back to Italy, back to the sunny Italy. And then eventually I um, made my way to United States. Uh, I was lucky enough to you know, save money, um, work hard. And I went to um, college here, medical school eventually. And um, really, truly, um, I'm one of those people who has been able to uh, experience uh, what American dream looks like, right? The things that we see on TV. So I've been practicing medicine. I'm a family doctor. So that's kind of GP in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been practicing medicine. Uh, I graduated medical school in 2004. So it's been a while now, 20 years. And, um, you know, when COVID started, I was already doing private practice. So I was able to kind of, kind of just kind of dig in, do my thing, stop listening to noise. I took care of the patients that were sick. Um, I'm lucky that I live in Texas, so I really didn't have mandates for too long. But while this was happening, I really started looking at the whole Think a little bit different than most doctors and most people because, you know, having grown up in communism, I started recognizing some situations, you know, the fear factor, the, the thing they wanted us to isolate so we, they, we cannot discuss things. Then they told us to, you know, wear a mask, stay six feet apart. That, that was kind of the bargaining phase, right? If you do this, you can, we'll let you do that. And that's kind of how totalitarian regimes uh, do things. And another thing that I realized watching at the time, I was watching the, you know, the media, Fox News, actually. It didn't make sense that, like, you know, the UK prime minister, our president, Australian uh, prime minister, all of these presidents and prime ministers were saying exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was like, build back better, right? So I started looking at this a little bit differently and realizing there is a little bit more to it and um, realized that we need to start connecting globally. So I actually connected early on with World Council for Health and was part of the steering committee for a while. 
and then decided to concentrate more on some different things and left the World Council for Health and now I'm president of Global Health Project. And for some of your subscribers who maybe follow me on Twitter, they'll see that I tend to cover a lot what's happening with World Health Organization because I recognize that they are really United Nations is the driving force about a lot of these initiatives with their agenda 2030. But from the health standpoint, you have World Health Organization who's doing okay. a lot of dirty work. Okay. Uh, Kat, thank you. Before we go into the World Health Organization and their dirty work, I want to go back to right at the beginning with, with lockdown and all that was going mm-hmm. on. Now, I admit that for the first six, six weeks, I bought into it. I, I did the social distancing. I wore a mask. I locked down and everything. And then after six weeks, I was a bit like, why am I just going along with what governments and corporations are saying without questioning it? And that was when I started looking at it, because I, I suppose from a Pakistani background and a mm-hmm. legacy of British imperialism, and it's like, they don't really operate in the self in the best interests of the people, the elites. They don't, right? British empire wasn't a philanthropic exercise. So, so then I began to question it. And one of the things I noticed, you know, the whole thing about, um, you know, I'm going to say to you, Kat, right? You got to, I'll tell you what you can wear when you go out. You can wear a mask, right? I'll tell you when you can go out, who you can associate with. Don't worry about having your own income. I'll give you some pin money every now and then. And I'm doing, oh, by the way, you have to have this medication, right? And I'm doing all this for your good. Well, that's what yeah. I deal with as a child protection social worker with men, usually men, who are perpetrators of domestic abuse. That's what they say to their partners. I'll tell you when you can go out. I'll tell you who you can mix with. I'll tell you what to wear. You're going to be financially dependent upon me. And this is all for your own good. And I thought, well, the government's doing this. And then when you said about you could see that this was totalitarian strategies used by Warsaw Pact nations. How so? What? what, what I mean, because I don't remember the Soviet, ever reading about the Soviet Union saying, like, you know, you've got to be six feet apart and stuff. Well, but you have to realize what I did is the tactics that they used, right? It was fear factor. Uh, I, I'm sure you remember initially watching on TV. Um, first of all, if you watched the TV, you would see that the number of cases that were diagnosed was going up. The number of deaths was going up. The the um, colors were always in the red and the ticker on the bottom kept on doing this. It's almost like, you know, you do crypto, so you're in finances and stuff. So you see, like, you know, it's like financial reports. They go up, up or down, down, down. So that's kind of how you, how you start getting people to pay attention. And then the videos from China, for us, the videos from New York, you know, they were uh, putting a uh, hospital in uh, central. They were doing like tense hospitals in New York because the more and morgues were overfilling. So that's the fear factor. And then after that fear is introduced into the public, you start isolating them. So for us, at some point, um, you know, I was the first responder, so I was always able to go out every day because I had to go to work. But most people stayed home with their children, with their spouses, and they were told that they cannot leave. And then you can only go shopping if you stay in line. And the stores had, you know, the line that's like six feet apart. And then you could go shopping during this period of time. And then they introduced the masks. So you can do this if you're wearing a mask. You can go to the restaurant if you're wearing a mask. But, as, you know, and if you're standing, the mask has to be on. But if you're sitting down, it's okay. The mask can come off. And then eventually the um, injections came along. And they said, well, if you get the injection, first of all, you're going to be protecting someone. But not only that, if you get the injection, you can go back to work. So that's kind of where the, so what happens, you have fear, you have isolation, and then you have the bargaining phase. Mm -hmm. After bargaining doesn't really work, then you have the mandate phase. Well, if you don't do this, you're going to lose your job. Those type of tactics are used in communism on different scales or in totalitarian regimes where the government or the dictators control your way of life. And that's what I recognize. You know, I recognize the fear first because I remember coming home Late at night, I was in private practice, but I was doing some uh, shift work in urgent care to uh, earn some extra money while I was build, building my practice. And I remember coming home, it was like 11.30 at night. And at the time, this was like at the height of everything bad that was happening. And I was really stressed out, like thinking like, what am I bringing home to my family? And I was talking to my friend and she goes to me and her mom is from, was born in Russia. Uh, she escaped, uh, you know, the Soviet regime. And she, we were just kind of talking. She goes to me, Kat, you're having PTSD. And I was like, what? And then I really thought about it. And I'm like, yes, I've been recognizing this. And I was having this low level of anxiety 
Mm. You know, um, and then once the switch turned off, I'm like, yes, I know what this is. And that was really early on for me. So it was that aspect. But then from the doctor scientist uh, side, what never made sense is I'm considered a first responder. If there is something unknown in the world, some kind of disease, as a doctor, I understand the risk of, I understand the potential risk of what's going on, but it doesn't mean I can abandon my job. My job is to try to figure out how to help. Mm. So even if it was something extremely deadly, I would expect, and I know that I would have done it, and at least the colleagues I work with, for us to just go in, try to do our job, and whatever happens, happens, right? But they told us not to do anything. They told us to tell the patients not to come to the clinics, but to stay home, take some Tylenol and ibuprofen, and then when they can't breathe, go to the hospital. Mm. Well, that makes no sense because even if I don't know what's uh, what's happening, right, even if I don't know what's causing it, I can recognize stages of a disease, whether it's a virus, bacteria, anything. Our body goes through different stages, right? It goes to the infection stage. It goes to inflammation stage. It goes into reaction phase. So the, for all of those phases, you have certain things you can help with. So you might not have a cause that you can cure, but you can help people navigate through these stages of an illness. But they told us not to do anything. They told us just to like tell them to stay home until they can't breathe. We've never done anything like it. So that was number one. Number two was mask. So I don't know how they do it in UK, but every year, if you work in a hospital, you have to go see infectious disease department. They put a um, clear helmet over your head. You put a mask on and it's N95 mask. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, and they put a helmet over your head and then they spray inside the helmet with different molecules. One of them is saccharin solution. If you can smell, if you can taste saccharin in your mouth, when they sprayed it inside the helmet, that means that the fit of the mask was not good. Mm -hmm. I have too much space here. That means I need a smaller mask or whatever. So every year we were fitted specifically for a mask to get the seal so that nothing can enter it. So initially, when they started with the masking, at least in the healthcare um, aspect, we were told to wear a mask. Wear a we were wearing a visor, a yellow, like infectious disease suit over the scrubs and things like that so they started running out of it so then they said only the n95 mask is okay they ran out of that one then they said surgical mask was okay well it wasn't and at one point our cdc actually said to wear a bandana yes. and that's kind of where where i completely lost trust in cdc and you from that point on no matter what they say this is really nonsense from you know from what they're trying to do and what people have to realize I know there is a lot of backlash on, on physicians abandoning their Hippocratic oath, duty, and all that. Yeah. We were all, and I would suspect it's the same in UK and other countries with your regulatory agencies and stuff, we were all indoctrinated to truly trust our agencies. There was no reason for us to be mistrustful of it to the level that people are now. It's almost like, you know, if you're a Christian and you have a Bible, it's almost as like you read the Bible your whole life and all of a sudden someone tells you Bible is full of lies and mm -hmm. Jesus is not your savior. It's kind of almost to that level. So I think, you know, when people, and, and I get the frustration, I get the loss of trust, I get all of this and I really sympathize, understand, and I have had the same reaction to a certain extent. But I would also like people to think about giving others in their, whether it's their family or whomever, give them grace. Because we are all at a different level of understanding and um, coming kind of almost come to Jesus type of a moment, as we say, say here in the United States. You know, you have to give people time to accept that the reality is different from what we were taught yes. and what we thought that we knew. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a very good point. I mean, I think that in particular to those that had the injections, they they got fooled, they got hoodwinked, they got misled, they fell for it. They're not to blame and they're hurting. And, you know, some people took it because they wanted to travel or because, you know, a father wanted to or a mother wanted to provide for their families. The only way they could, they had to do it to go to work. 
I know, and that's a really important point because I hear, you know, I, I, I see a lot of tweets on Twitter, especially now. It's like, I would never date a vaccinated person or they were fooled. And why were they fooled? And I was so much smarter than they were. First of all, a lot of people got vaccinated because they thought they're doing the right thing. Mm. A lot of some people did get vaccinated maybe for traveling or other things, but maybe they had to travel to go see an uh, elderly sick relative. We need to like stop generalizing these things and just accept it happened. Yep. And this is what we now we have to deal with. And we should not judge people for choices they're made. We just need to find a way to move forward together. Yes. Um, I I think if we start, you know, it, it's almost like the, the story of you know um, Solomon and dividing the baby in half, and you know, and who deserves and and, and all of that. It's like we need to be gracious, we need to be careful, and we need to um, just accept that this is the reality we're all in now and find the best way forward for all of us without judging. One of the things that I've always hated, um, and I hope like I'll probably get a lot of hate for this myself, <laughs> I don't like the word pure blood. Right. I find pure blood so um, uh, Elite, kind of demeaning. Yes, yeah. and also demeaning to the people. It's like we don't know which situation we're in, the people that chose to do something we're in. And, you know, like you said, maybe father or mother had to do this so they can actually have a job to feed their children. So we need to kind of stop being the ones that judge because at the end of the day, we're going to be judged as well. Yeah, and and also uh, we we need to come together for two reasons. One is what they want, what the WEF want, is for us to fight each other. Yes. Uh, divide and rule. But also, we need them on our side because we've got a common enemy. You know, the people that had the injections, they're not the enemy. They're not the ones out no. there for our livelihoods. So we've got to come together and have compassion and, and unite with them. And, and, and then also, I, got, I, got, I have to uh, – I, I always got to consider that somewhere in some aspect of life, I'm being fooled. You know, I'm I'm a human being. I make mistakes. You know, I I went along with lockdown for six weeks. I wanted to be for Britain to be part of the EU in the beginning, and then I changed my mind and other things like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And and the they that want to split us and divide us, so that they we don't notice what they're doing, include the World Health Organization, which is a partner of the W. EF, the World Economic Forum. So do you want to say, because um, you were going to go on to the World Health Organization, then I interrupted you. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to, you know, the story continues, right? So you even during the um, pandemic, for um, lack of a better oh, word. Lock, um, during the lockdown. That's what I call it. It wasn't a pandemic, but during that lockdown period. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, by the real, by the definition of pandemic, and they have changed the, the definition of pandemic. Yes, it was not a pandemic, but we also have to recognize that they've declared it as such, and they acted as if it was. And yeah. because they declared they were, they were able to do a lot of these things legally and legislatively that otherwise they would not have been able to do. So saga continues, right? We're kind of now on a sequel, let's call it. Um you have, first of all, the World Health Organization during this uh, period has done everything wrong. You know, from the beginning, they said, you know, it wasn't China and we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. And then um, one thing that they actually kind of did right, um, they actually used a, uh, um, ivermectin in India. Mm. They had it in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, I believe, is the uh, province. They actually had it as a home kit. And uh, if you looked at the data from there, the, their population actually did very well. So they did some things right. But even was, at some point that, on their... So it wasn't that the state government rather than the World Health Organization? No, it was by the recommendation of the World Health Organization. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. And also at some point, they actually, even on their website, uh, had remdesivir as uh, not a good medication for the... Um, COVID, right? And then, you know, they changed their minds and all that. But um, after all this that has happened, in 21, they got together with, uh, you know, the um, the leaders of the world, Macrons of the world, uh, 
your guy Boris, uh, our guy, and uh, you know they all got together, Australians and um, and some of the member states and stuff like that. And they said, you know what, we need to create a better collaboration if something like this happens again. So let's you know negotiate this pandemic treaty. So they started working on something called pandemic treaty. But there's actually two things they're working on. One is the pandemic treaty. The other one is amendments to international health regulation. And international health regulation are a set of regulations that already have been adopted by all of the member states. And there's 194 member states in the World Health Organization. So now they're trying to amend those regulations. So currently, they're working on two documents. Essentially, what these two documents would do is, in an event there is another pandemic, the World Health Organization would have different things they could do. First of all, they could censor um, anyone who strays away from the narrative of the public health messaging that comes from the World Health Organization. So, for example, the physicians who might say, well, I don't agree with that, could get censored and then punished by their um, government or regulatory bodies and things like that. And then uh, there is something called Article 18 in the Amendments of International Health Regulation that would give Director General powers in an event that he thinks there is an emergency somewhere. He could declare a public health emergency of international concern. And then once he declares that, he can um, enact a set of uh, different rules. Some of them is actually requiring certain prophylactic treatment um, demanding certain treatment, vaccinations, um, isolation, quarantine, um, keeping the people who are suspected of having this illness in quarantine isolated and kind of, you know, put away, close the borders, um, close the trade across the borders in, in this region. So to give an example, like let's say there is an outbreak of something in Brazil. WHO finds out about it. They send a team. The team says this is a concern, public health emergency a concern. The director general closed down the region. And then from there on, he can decide to expand it or whatever. Now, the country itself, Brazil, cannot uh, object to it. In the past, the country would be able to object. Now, they would not be able to. So let's say Brazil says, you know what? That's something that happens every summer. We're not concerned. It's not a big deal. No, if Director General says this is a public health emergency of international concern and he decides to close it off, that's it. Another thing that has changed, in the past, the World Health Organization would give advice. And they would say, well, we think this is happening. We think this is what you need. They have crossed out the wording non-binding, and these non-binding advice now becomes obligatory recommendations. So, And in the document itself, the word shell has been written 168 times. So they say, if this happens, the member states shall do this. So the whole relationship that they had with the member states where they used to be an advisory organization now really becomes an organization that dictates how certain measures would be taken if there is another public health emergency. And if you follow Tedros, you would know that we are just a pandemic away from disaster, right? There is this Unknown disease X. By the way, if you can't tell by the, the tone of my voice, I'm being sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic. Oh, no, Just, no, no. You know. It's true. It's true. There's this disease X. It's coming. They don't know what it is, but they've already got a vaccine. <laughs> it is, and it's 20 times worse, right? Oh, my they God, don't know yes. what it is, but it's 20 at times least, worse. At least and Oxford, they already have it. <laughs> and, and Gavi Alliance, and actually, I think it was CEPI, C-E-P. I think CEPI and Oxford University are working on the vaccine already. But they don't know what it is, and it's you know, twenty times deadlier. That's because they are working faster than the speed of science. <laughs> well, in their defense, I kind of have an idea of what they're trying to do with that vaccine. You know, I'm not sure, but they're probably trying to like create a backbone of something, right? So if like something happens, that they can just insert the genetic material and speed it up. But again, Some it's like of- just the idea that they're already working on it makes my okay. skin crawl there's some sort of general antiviral antibacterial agent like vitamin d perhaps or vitamin c perhaps exactly you would think something <laughs> something that we could yeah but yes. with mrna added mrna for extra yes, safety exactly. and effectiveness. 
Okay. So, you know, so anyway, you know, with these amendments and the pandemic treaty, there is a big concern. There's many regulations in there and people should actually read both documents to understand. Um, one of my favorite things is Tedros keeps on saying this people who are telling you that this is an attack on sovereignty are lying. We are not going to attack your sovereignty. We're going to leave you, the countries to stay sovereign and whatever, whatever, whatever. What he doesn't talk about is these amendments to international health regulation. He always talks about the treaty. Now, if you read the treaty by itself, you could maybe make that argument. But when you attach the treaty with the amendments that are happening at the same time, you cannot anymore. There are too many articles changes, too many dictates from uh, World Health Organization. And another thing they're introducing that people maybe heard about is something called One Health. The one health agenda that they're trying to insert into this whole thing is pretty much saying that the lives of humans, animals, plants are all interchangeable. The human life is not more worthy than the plant's life, and it's all dependent on climate change. Yes. So please. And another thing, please. Uh, I'm sorry. I know I'm being a little bit no, 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 sarcastic. No, no. Ha, but it's ha, like. Ha. We're all going to die. We're all going <laughs> to yeah. die because, because, of, because of plant food, or because of carbon dioxide. Yeah, and in the climate climate crisis is the next health crisis. So if you guys are not aware, please I saw you should something. have you should have a banner somewhere. Climate health crisis is the next health crisis. I saw something a few days ago. He said something about how uh, it, climate change is racist or something because it affects black people disproportionately. Yes, I th saw that one too. Yes, that was an interesting uh, an interesting okay. one as well. Here's my take on it. And I offer it to you as a former European from a, a war, brought up in a Warsaw Pact nation, is that the whole climate change agenda is European imperialism for the 21st century. In you know the 17th and 18th and 19th century, Europe's civilizing mission was Christianity to Americas and Africa and India as a pretense for plundering resources and enslaving the local populations. Now. Those imperial hegemons, with their with their you know the inheritors of that noble imperial legacy, the uber elite in the European former imperial powers, isn't it funny how the continent that is a net importer of hydrocarbons is telling the rest of the world no hydrocarbons for you, no fossil fuel development for Bangladesh or Tanzania. No, we'll tell you how to live. You've got to go solar and wind power. You've got to do it according to our rules. Oh, and by the way, it's for your own good. Yeah. But you know what's interesting? You said uh, you know, a little while ago that you were initially for uh, EU, and then you realized the trap. But that's actually, um, I was in Croatia uh, in December testifying in their parliament regarding the World Health Organization. Because what's happening currently, European Commission is negotiating the, the treaty and the IHRs for the member states of the European uh, Union in their name. They actually don't have that power. And that was kind of my message to the parliament. I read the con Croatian constitution. And in the constitution, there is an article that specifically says that any treaties, uh, especially if they have financial impact, have to come in front of the uh, Croatian parliament and the parliament has to vote on it. And it's true for all the European uh, Union countries, you know, uh, Switzerland has to ratify all these things. But European Union actually is trying to, uh, to, I always say European Union, the commission and, and the bureaucrats are the microcosm of what's happening in the world. They're the exact example of what we don't want to happen because, um, you know, when I was back home in December and during these last two, three years, actually, every time I go to Europe, I go back home for a couple of days if I can. Every time I came, more and more, I felt that Croatia was losing its own national identity. When I went there initially, they were using Kuna, which is the Croatian uh, money exchange. And then last time I went, they're using Euro. So that's what the European Union wants. And this is, goes back to their globalism and totalitarianism I spoke about before. The idea of these globalists, and if you listen to, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of like ADHD of ideas. I actually don't have ADD, but my thoughts are kind of all over the place because everything is really connected. People yes. are not making connections, but they're connected. So if you remember in January, the uh, NATO um, uh, director, general, whatever his name, uh, Gutierrez, says 
that we need global governance, right? Global governance is going to bring peace, prosperity, and whatever other nonsense he said. But that's what the European Union is actually doing. And what they want is they want all of us. They want Americans. They want Croatians. They want British, uh, Pakistani. They want all of us to forget who we are as nations. You know, I'm an American, but I was born Croatian. And part of me will always be Croatian and always remember our history. And I'm proud of it. And I tell it to my children and my friends. You know, the first cathedral in the world is actually Sveti Duja and Split. It was mausoleum to Diocletian Emperor. So, so I mean, Emperor Diocletian. So those are things I want to share with the world. I don't want to forget them. But that's what European Union and these globalists want. They want us to become one. They want us to become this mass. They don't want us to be proud of who we are. Well, that ties into the totalitarian spirit, because one of the things I notice about lockdown and the policies instituted by British government and the WEF captured governments in Canada and the United States and Australia and New Zealand and the European Union is they want to destroy religion. They want to destroy faith. They want to destroy culture. They want to destroy family. So that we, they want to destroy our own identity, our own sense of myself. So I'm so confused. I don't know whether I'm a man or a woman anymore, right? I think somehow, despite having X, Y in every single cell in my body apart from my gametes, right? My zygotes. I don't. I, I just don't know. I can't tell. And I think I. I think I have the thoughts that a woman would have. I, I, don't. I don't. Well, that's actually no. I know what you're saying, but that actually is very important conversation because that's what they're doing to our children. Yes. You know, this is this has nothing to do with a uh, 40 year old man who decides he's a transgender or a 30 or 60 year old woman. It has nothing to do with them. They will do whatever they want. They're free to do whatever they want. Wh- whatever. But what they're doing with this transgender ideology is attacking our children. Because essentially, that's exactly what they're doing. They want to erase our children's identity. They want our children to become units. And once you become a unit, you are very easily controlled and you are easily, um, you know, told what to do and how to do things. And like as the part you said about religion, that's really important. It's not really religion. It's really faith. Yes. The part about faith, it's extremely important. You know, I, I'm a Christian, but whatever re- religion and faith you are, believe in it because you should believe in something greater than yourself. They want to take that away from us because they want. So there is a faith and then there is a religion. They want the government to become our religion and they want they want to take away our faith because if you have no faith, if you have no hope for the better future, if you have no grace, if you have no um, goodness in your heart, then they can do whatever they want and um, they can truly control and we were not going to care what happens. And we have seen that to a certain extent during this pandemic. They, they were able to beat, I would say, the world's spirit down somewhat mm. until we realized that we're stronger than them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember watching a video during uh, lockdown, this guy in Hyde Park, and the police were arresting him. This is during lockdown in the social distancing. And what he was doing, he was standing there saying to passers-by, would you like a hug? Would you like a yeah. hug? Right? And then if people said, yeah, he gave them a hug. So it was all consensual, no assault. The mm-hmm. police were arresting him for violating social distancing rules. And he's standing next to the police officers. He said, listen, I don't care about the laws of man. I'm a Christian. I listen to the laws of God. And that's, yeah. the, that's the challenge that totalitarians have with people of faith. Because the other thing about people of faith is they have integrity. I mean, they're human beings, right? But you know, people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Malcolm X even, it's like, okay, I've got my faith. That is going to be my anchor. And then Des- Bishop Desmond Tutu, I'm not going to shift on this. I'm not going to shift on this. This is, a, this is unjust. Whereas people without faith, they they have no anchor. And then the other thing about the transgender um, play, that project, is that it ruptures families. Hundred percent. I, you know, I'm I'm my children by the, my 19 year old and my 16 year old never have never been to school. They were unschooled, and uh, because I wanted them to have an education. But I'm fortunate. You know, I think even now it's even more critical for children, for parents to take their kids out of school and make that work. But for kids in school 
And I, and I see that. And then the parents have to deal with their boy thinking, a 13 year old boy thinking he's a girl. And the mom and the dad are saying, no, 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 no. And then it creates a schism in the family. Yeah. And, and then the, the crazy, I, I, I had to deal with this. I come across this a little bit as a child protection social worker in the UK. The crazy thing is, this is so not an issue in the global South. It's so not an issue. Boys and girls, you know, teenagers, they don't really have a confusion. No, I'm a boy. I'm a girl. That's it. It's really clear. It's here in the WEF sponsored nations, uh, controlled nations. Okay. Yeah. So back to the World Health Organization and a really important point about how people aren't tying it all together, the climate change agenda. Uh, I know we haven't mentioned it yet. CBDCs, digital IDs, trans agenda, uh, also the open borders. Open mm -hmm. borders did not work for India because it allowed the British to come in and destroy local industry, destroy local culture, colonize the people. Open borders didn't work for the people of Africa. Mm -hmm. right, you've got to have a say in who's coming into your house. So, and it's not working for United States. You know, I'm in Texas and we're dealing with uh, uh, open borders. And, and it's, you know, I, I wrote today uh, to reply to someone on Twitter, nation without border, it's not a nation. Not a nation. You no. know, it, it's, it's ridiculous what we have allowed to happen to, um, to all our nations, you know, with the immigration, uh, the illegal immigration in Europe and UK, you guys are struggling with that as well. And, and uh, the amount of immigrants, you know, I'm a, an immigrant, I'm mm -hmm. a legal immigrant, it took me, oh, it took me, I think, almost 10 years to become a uh, citizen, but I did it legally from the beginning. Um, it was a process that took several years. I used to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and have to be in line to get the number to be seen that day. You know, it was a huge process, but I'm proud I did it, and I'm you grateful for it. the way it. You, were, you were vetted. It isn't like, I, I mean, I, I, For I, sure. what's happening in Ireland is horrific because Ireland is a hom homogenous nation. And I hadn't been for about 20 years. And then I went last year. I was only in Dublin Airport for a day or so. And I just saw it. And I couldn't believe it. It looked like London. And what that does, when you bring in people, it's one thing when the economy is booming. Mm -hmm. You need the labor. You need skilled labor. And you're checking who's coming in. And then, you know, they're, they're becoming part of the society and contributing. It's another when people just turn up and the people are already struggling with the cost of living, things are already expensive because the government's printing money like crazy and then they're being put up in hotels. Well, that's just going to create resentment and destroy love yeah. and tradition. Well, in New York, they're getting $10,000, like a card with $10,000 on it. Uh, they're staying in hotels. And we have veterans, we have homeless people, American citizens who have no help who don't have anywhere to go. They're under the overpasses in tents living and uh, really at the mercy of charities uh, for food and clothes and things like that. Our, and the government doesn't take care of them while we're just you know, taking in immigrants, legal, illegal immigrants. That, that's the word that we need to keep on using, illegal, uh, into the illegal. States and they fly them Unvested. all over the States. They, by the way, uh, I don't know when is the last time you were in the United States. And I know UK, actually, you guys are even worse than we are. Going through your airport is a freaking nightmare. Like if you have a, a perfume bottle that has like, I forget how many ounces you can have. But it's like they make you take it out of the bag. And it's like, it's such a process. But no, for illegal immigrants, the United States don't even have to worry about security. They just go through. It doesn't matter what they have. They get on the plane without documents. You know, um, yeah, I can I can go on and on on that part. I don't think you want me to, but it, yeah. it, it's, no, no, it's a travesty no. what's happening. But it's all part of the same agenda because it has us fighting each other, destroys society, destroys culture, dis destroys faith, destroys family, uh, destroys local traditions. So it just so it just fragments everything, and then a fragmented society is easier to rule. Hundred percent easier to yeah. control. Um, and that's kind of where everything falls in. You know, this illegal immigration. It's not one story here. The WHO pandemic treaty is not one story here. The digital vaccine passport from European Union, it's not one isolated story. They actually are all connected like this. And um, the what they're trying to achieve is this idea of global governance. Because uh, the World Health Organization, for example, adopted this last summer the European Union project of digital vaccine passport. And they already have several pilots in different countries that they're doing right now. 
And then on the other hand, you have this United Nations with the Agenda 2030, with their uh, work with uh, the, uh, what is the central bank, where they're trying to introduce a central bank digital currency. Now, they actually are not on track there, from what I understand. Um, they had a pilot in Nigeria that failed terribly. So I, as much as they're talking about it, I don't think they're very close to implementing it. But just the idea of combining this CBDC with a digital uh, travel passport, you can kind of see where... It, and, and then let's not forget the carbon credit, right? Every yeah. time you travel right now, the carbon tra- credit is voluntary. Soon enough, it's not going to be voluntary. So combine all these things and you do enter this potential era of social credit score as we see in China. Yes. So. How do you think it's huge danger? How do you think Sorry? how do you think this great reset project is going? It's not going well. But I think what we need to realize, um, uh, first of all, I think people have rebelled to the great extent people are realizing what uh, it's actually that's really hard to tell because I think we live in a bubble. I think you and I live in a, in our own bubble of people who think like us. So I'm not necessarily sure what is the true temperature of everything. But from my perspective, I would say that their plans are not going well. For example, even the World Health Organization treaty and uh, amendments, the talks are kind of stalling. I, but I still fear that, well, I can say that uh, they definitely have intention of keep on doing it. So we mm-hmm. should not take this lightly, right? That's kind of what I'm trying to say. I'm, you know, I, I do think that we're winning to a certain extent. Uh, we have won a lot of different battles. We have won when it comes to the COVID-19 injections. The booster intake is down everywhere in the world. So that's one good thing that we're winning. People are um, fighting back even on digital money. People are trying to say, well, I want to use cash. There's, there's definitely a movement of doing that. People are also decentralizing if they can. Like you said, some parents are taking kids out of school and homeschooling them. Uh, A lot of people are realizing that the medicine generally is broken and there are many things that they can do on their own before they have to go to the doctor. So I think we're starting to learn a more wholesome way of life. Mm. And by doing that, we are creating a resistance. But I would caution people not to be... um, for lack of the better word, cocky. Oh, complacent, uh, yes. Yeah, because I do think that like, if you keep on saying, well, we're winning and they're not going to do this, they are, because let's take France. I don't know if you watched my Twitter last week, but France, uh, the lower house, I don't know what they, the assembly, passed a law that any talks of different therapeutic, in the, 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 or certain treatments or prophylactic, if, if you're against it, that people could actually go to jail and be fined. Now it has to go to the Senate and get passed in the Senate. It hasn't It hasn't become a law, but there is a potential that anyone who criticizes mRNA platform or any future platforms like that could end up in jail or be fined up to 45,000 euros. Mm. So while you and I think that we're winning here, they are doing so much more here. And yeah. it's like tug of war. Like, you know, you win here, you lose there. So... We need to remain vigilant. That's really what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, and I, and I think uh, I think they are going to lose. I think they're going to they're going to keep on because abusers just keep on abusing. All they got is more abuse, right? I'm going to just try keep abusing and getting away with it because they don't know how not to abuse. And then, but the resistance is going to keep growing, keep growing. I think it's going to take some time. I think we will prevail, and the Great Reset will fail. But we can't afford to be complacent. And why we will prevail is because of conversations like this, because of us sharing, because of the growth of decentralization, because of the resistance. Um, I don't know if you ever watch any of my videos with Tom Luongo. If not, you definitely, definitely should. But one of the he one of the things he says is people aren't sheep; they're comfortable wolves. And when you impinge upon them, like what's happening with the farmers in Europe, like uh, I think what's happening in Texas is like no enough. No more. No more. This is it. Enough. So and like what happened in Nigeria with the CBDC. No way. I mean, they were transacting people were using matchsticks for crying out rather than the rather than the e-nera. Right. Um, so, so I think there's but I think it's important to recognize that this is not um, our war. 
I really feel very strongly that this is our children's yes. uh, war. I do think that what we can do and what we must do is um, um, empower our children to be strong, to recognize what's happening, and to continue this. Because this is not going to be yours and mine. I think this is just that first uh, wave. And uh, our job as parents is to make sure that our children are equipped to handle this. Because uh, this is going to be something that they will have to deal with. This is generational. You know, this is going to take maybe a couple of generations. And if you look at the history of the world, uh, something like this, uh, this a movement like this that they've tried to do, you know, uh, all these chess pieces. What we what happened is we didn't realize that they were playing chess with us. We were just going along, you know, here and there, moving a couple of pieces on the on the chess board, but we didn't realize they truly are playing a game of war with us. We thought it was just for fun. Mm. And I think once we woke up to re- recognize that, like you know, uh, the king and queen are under assault. Now it became real, and we're just trying to catch up. And they are several chess pieces ahead of us, you know, um, but we are catching up to it. But I fear that this is a kid's war. So what you and I can do is make sure that while we're having conversation to get more parents and others to recognize what's happening, we need to have these same conversations with our kids and um, give them a set of tools to be able to continue this because they, they will have to. Yes, and the, and also our friends that are parents and our friends that aren't parents, we just got to keep spreading the word and keep speaking up, keep speaking up. And um, during lockdown, when it looked like the mandates might be coming to England, thank goodness they didn't. I mean, I kept my mouth shut, just kept my mouth shut. I didn't want anybody to know that I hadn't had the injection, just ignored the conversation, didn't get involved. And then at some point I realized I had to speak up. I had to speak up in order to build alliances with others in order to you know warn people about these injections and then to build alliances i can't do this on my own we can't do this on, on our own so we've got to spread the word and empower the forces of decentralization which by the way i think includes bitcoin but then i would say that decentralized money banksters can't control they can't print it in order to kill to make munitions to kill people in other parts of the world okay cat anything else you want to say before we finish up I think we touched on many, many things. Uh, I, the only thing I would like to say, you know, I, I'm a parent as well. I have five children. Wow. And, um, Congratulations. <laughs> thanks. I would say we just need to keep on doing what we're doing. The important thing is uh, to create our own communities, right? To, to start at home and then build outward and create a strong community around yourself. Because if you have a strong community, then uh, it's going to be so much easier for yourself to defend yourself and the family and the friends and things like that and we keep on talking and learning from each other and uh make sure that we don't um judge i think that's one of the biggest messages i would have is we need to come from this um i like to really i, I like to use the word grace a lot because i, I think we need that. to you know i was thinking yeah. that being mindful of god yes we need to really you know not judge because we will be judged as well yes who am i to judge another by the way just to let you know personal between you and i although i am muslim i go to quaker meetings on a regular basis to listen to the spirit so thank you cat thank you so much i'll have the links in the description below um and if anybody have any questions or comments uh put them in the description below please share this video far and wide please subscribe follow cat on twitter and between now when i see you next please keep filling your pockets with grace compassion and freedom it's crypto rich and crypto cat signing out all the best bye bye Bye.